Let's turn to Luke 21. And while you're turning to uh, Luke 21, I've been a leak. Um, while you're turning to Luke 21, to give you a pre uh, overview of what's happened, Jesus, it's the last week of Jesus' life. He's in the temple, he's teaching, he knows he's going to be crucified at the end of the week. His disciples don't get that, but Jesus knows it's coming. He tells his disciples in verse 5 and 6 that the temple is going to be destroyed. And again, this was hard for them to fathom. Herod had been working on the temple since like for 20 some odd years at this point. It was one of the most magnificent structures in the ancient world. And those stones are massive. And he, Jesus is like, it's all going to be torn down. And the disciples are like, what? And so if you look in verses 7, the disciples are like, when is this going to happen? And then... And then before Jesus answers the question, the first thing he does in verse 8 and 9 is he says, don't be deceived. And he says, there's going to be false prophets and false messiahs that are coming, but the end won't come right away. And then Jesus describes the end. Now, when I say the end, I'm not talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about the end of this age. Because after this age is the millennial reign of Christ. But Jesus describes what's going to lead up to the end of this age and he says, nations are going to rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom and violent earthquakes and famines and plagues in various places. And then he says, there'll be terrifying signs in the heavens. And then he stops the tape. So he took his disciples all the way in. Then he stops the tape and he brings them back to their time in verse 12. And he says, but before all these things happen, many of you are going to be killed. And you're going to be persecuted because of me. And then after that, he continues with predicting the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in AD 70. He talks about that in verses 20 through 24. And remember, Jesus is now speaking as a prophet. And remember, prophets usually gave a near prediction of an event that often served as a template for the ultimate. So Jesus predicts that, the, that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, which happened just a few decades later. But that serves as the ultimate destruction when the Antichrist surrounds Jerusalem as well. And then Jesus, after that, he's, in verse 25 through 28, he talks about his return. Great signs in heaven, which remember, that's the difference between Jesus and others, false messiahs. There will be signs in the sky before Jesus returns. And he talks about coming down in the clouds. And Matthew talks about the sign of the Son of Man, which I believe is that pillar of fire that you saw in the desert, that Jesus will be riding that pillar of fire. And there's, there's going to be signs in the earth, and people are going to be you know, going crazy. And, and Jesus acknowledges believers are going to be on the earth at that time. He says in verse 28, when you see these signs, stand up because your redemption is drawing nigh. And then he's talked about his second coming. And then he goes into a parable. He teaches a parable, and that's what we're going to look at today. He teaches a parable, and remember, a parable is just an earthly story with earthly elements that has a spiritual meaning. And so let's take a look at this parable. He told them a parable, verse 29. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. And as soon as they put on leaves, you can see for yourselves and recognize that summer is near. Now we'll just stop there. We know what that's like. We've been through that just recently, right? We've seen the leaves, start, the trees starting to put on leaves. It's green outside. A lot of us are planting gardens, flowers. Cheryl this week, uh, by the way, I want to say a shout out to Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. She's responsible for all the beautiful flowers out here by the sign and in the back. And uh, so thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, I'll give her that. She does a great job. And uh, she knows all, that's her thing. She knows all about these flowers, and she was giving me a little education out there. Unfortunately, I forgot that, Cheryl. I've got to ask you some more questions. But uh, I was planning some beautiful things, and I know Jess and Roger worked to get all the old bushes out up there so we could get everything nice around the sign. But anyways, you know, when we see those flowers, hey, summer's coming, and it's almost here. It's getting hot outside and all those things. So Jesus gives a statement that, yeah, we all get that. But then he says this in the next verse, in the same way, when you see these things happening, what are these things? All the stuff that he's been talking about. Recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Now let me explain the kingdom of God. A kingdom is wherever the king is reigning, right? 
So the kingdom of God has two parts, just like this life. We have the physical part, right? We can see, touch, but there's also a spiritual side to this world, right? I believe there's potentially angels in this room right now. You just can't see them. There's a whole spiritual realm, a whole spiritual dimension out there. And, and so, on the one hand, if you've received Christ as your Savior, because from Luke chapter 4 it says Jesus went about preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand and the kingdom of God is here. If you've received Christ as your Savior, what I mean by that is you have said to God, look, I have rebelled, I get it, I'm not perfect, I've messed up, I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, I've lusted, I've done all these things that are against you, against your standard. I need help. And you know, I look at Jesus and how he lived his life and how he loved his enemies and what he taught and the fact that he died a cruel death on that cross and the fact that he rose again. He's the only person that's ever risen from the dead. And, and Jesus said, I am the way. Now, if you rise from the dead, I'll believe anything you say. And so he rose from the dead. He said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. And nobody gets to God except through me. And I believe that. And if you, if you say, Lord, yes, I, I believe what you said. You proved it by the fact that you rose from the dead. Your life certainly is a testament that you're different than any other religious leader. And, and okay, I believe. Save me. Save my soul. I want you to be the king in my heart. If you've done that, you're in the kingdom of God. From a spiritual standpoint. So this world is full of people who are in the kingdom of God. So on one hand, the kingdom of God is here. But on the other hand, it's not here yet. Because there is a physical side to the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, when you see these physical things, because that's what we've been talking about. When you see these physical things, understand that the kingdom of God is near. And then Jesus says this, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And Jesus is emphatic. Notice he says, truly I tell you. I mean, he's emphatic about this. That this generation will not pass away until when these things begin to happen. And then he, he backs it up and he says, look, verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will never pass away. Jesus wants to make it clear that the generation that sees these things is going to experience his return of Christ. Now here's my question. Are we the final generation? There have been, I get it, preachers since Jesus ascended saying, the end is near. You've seen the crazy guy with the signs, the end is near. There have been, you know, when the year 1000 happened, people were all huddled in churches because they thought that was the end of the world. There have been people throughout the centuries saying, the end is here, the end is here. And I get it. It's not happened yet. And in fact, the Apostle Paul says in the last days, there will be scoffers saying, where is the sign of his coming? And, uh, and today you may be thinking, well, I don't think we're the last generation. I'm going to argue today that I believe we are. I believe we are the final generation. And I'll tell you why. Follow along because this may wreck your world. First of all, what is a generation? A generation is usually considered a group of people that are kind of born and have the same general characteristics. And, and, and in America, we've had a lot of different generations. For example, if you were born from 1883 to 1900, you were called the lost generation. Then there was the greatest generation. Those were the people that fought in World War II. They were born roughly from 1901 to 1927. Then there was the silent generation, 1928 to 1945. Some folks here are in the silent generation. Then there was the baby boomers. They were born from 1946 to 1964. Many baby boomers are here. My generation is next, Gen X. We were born from 1965 to 1980. We were the last ones that knew what it was like to live without the internet and uh, a lot of things. We drank out of garden hoses. 
crazy stuff. Then you have the millennials, the snowflakes, 1981, not really. 1981 and 1996, they grew up with the internet. Then you had the Gen Zs. My son was, would be a millennial. Gen Z, 1997 to 2012. And now we have what's called Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha are basically those born from the 2010s until the mid-2020s. They are the first generation to have been born in the 21st century. That whole generation in the 21st century. In fact, they estimate that there'll be 2 billion Gen Alphas by 2025 in the world. And, you know, so we kind of have these generations. And when people look at the Bible, a lot of times people say, well, a, a generation in the Bible is roughly 40 years, 30 to 40 years. And, I, and I've read those arguments, but to me, there is a place in the Bible where we are told by God what a generation is. And it's way back in the book of Genesis. I'm going to throw it on the screen. Because what we need to know when Jesus says this generation, I want to know what does God call a generation? How long? Well, this is back in Genesis. I'll put it on the screen. Genesis 15. God is talking to Abram. He is the, will be the father of the Jewish race. And he says, know this for certain. Your offspring, he's speaking about the Jews, would have come from Abraham, will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be a slave and oppressed. What's he talking about? The Jews going into Egypt. And he says they're going to be there for 400 years. He says, however, I will judge the nation they serve and afterwards they will go out with many possessions. You know the story maybe? Moses came in, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no, here comes a plague. You know, and there's ten plagues. God judges Egypt, and finally Pharaoh's like, get out of here. And they, pl they plundered the Egyptians, and they left. But you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Abram, you're not going to see this. You're going to die before this happens. In the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquities of the Amorites have not reached its full measure. So what did God say? They're going to be there for 400 years, and the fourth generation, they're coming out. Now, when I read that, I said, well, apparently God defines a generation as roughly 100 years. It seems that way, give or take, but roughly 100 years. That's what God defines a generation. So again, I, I, and here's the other thing. The exodus, what, let me stop there. What is the greatest event of deliverance for the Jews? What was the greatest event? We just talked about it. The exodus. What is the next greatest event of deliverance on the human calendar? The second coming of Christ. Right? And, and you know what's interesting? When you look at the Exodus and the second coming of Christ, there are parallels. For example, Moses was from Egypt. He left Egypt. He came back to Egypt to lead his people out. Jesus came to the earth. He's left the earth. He's coming back to the earth to lead his people out. Moses stood up against the most powerful man in the world at the time. Jesus, when he comes, he will stand up against the most powerful man in the earth. That's the Antichrist. Again, Mo Satan fought against Moses by having all these fake signs and wonders that the magicians did, the Pharaoh's Egyptians did. Before Jesus comes back, you're going to have signs and wonders by false prophets and false messiahs. It's a replay. Again, Moses led his people out of Egypt. Christ will lead his people out of this world and Moses led his people to the promised land and Jesus will lead us to the promised land we could go on there's all sorts of parallels between Jesus and Moses and the exodus and the second coming and so when I'm looking at this I'm thinking wow the one place that God defines a generation is dealing with the exodus and in the second coming Jesus talks about generation I think there's a there's a parallel there now so Jesus says in verse 32, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. So it seems to me, since we know what a generation was in the Old Testament, that logically there is a 100-year frame when these things happen before the return of Christ. Somewhere in that time, Christ is going to come 
that. You say, well, what are these things? What are these things? Well, if you go back to verse 9, something caught my eye when I was studying this passage a few weeks ago. And again, when you study the Bible, details matter. I don't think Jesus accidentally says things. And I found this very interesting. <clears throat> when Jesus starts answering their question, he says, when you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. Indeed, it is necessary that these things take place first, but the end won't be right away. Now, wait a minute, Jim. There's always been wars, and there's always been rebellions. Okay, yeah. But what caught my eye was Jesus, it's almost like these wars and rebellions have to happen. Because notice he says it's necessary that they happen. So it's like about any sort of wars and rebellions. We're talking about some sort of wars and rebellions that have to happen. That set the stage for the return of Christ. But even when they happen, it's not going to be immediately that Jesus returns. Because he says the end won't come right away. And I got thinking about that. Is there any set of wars and rebellions in human history that are unique from all other? And there are. And here's one of the reasons I believe we're in the last generation. We have experienced world wars. The 20th century was the first time that humanity had ever experienced a world war, a global war. We've experienced two of them. You know why? Because, because of the industrial age, we now had airplanes. We now had the ability to travel long distance because of motorized ships. <coughs> we had tanks. We had motorcycles. We had ballistics that nobody ever had before. And so we were able to travel long distances. And, and so we, in, in the 20th century, we experienced two world wars. Now, remember this. Bible prophecy centers on Israel, not on the United States. So I have to look, ask myself, okay, if Jesus said these wars are necessary, how in the world did they affect Israel? Well, let me give you just a real quick timeline. In 1896, there was a book called The Jewish State by Theodore Herzl. It really became the push for the Jews to return to their homeland because of growing anti-Semitism in Europe. And then began a series of what's called aliyahs. The word aliyah means the ascent. It means the return. And in 1882 to 1903, about 35,000 Jews came into is that area we call now Israel, their homeland. And then in 1904 to 1914, there was another 35,000 that came in. And then in 1914, World War I happened. Now, I need you to understand something. Just a little history, but hang on for just a second. Before World War I, this whole area where is, here's Jerusalem right here. This whole area was under control by the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire at one time encircled this whole area. It was huge. It was an Islam Islamic empire. You talk about colonization, look at Islam. They went through and colonized this whole area. And Jerusalem was part of it. There was absolutely no way they were going to allow the Jews to create their own homeland. Right? Because Islam doesn't want the Jews. They want them exterminated. So there was no way that there was ever going to be an Israel as long as the Ottoman Empire was in control. And they had been in control since around the 1400s of that area. And, and, and so there was no way there's ever going to be an Israel. But then World War I happens. And in 1917, the Ottoman Empire collapsed because of the war. And in November of 1917, there was the Bellflower Declaration sent to the, the British, to, signed, which basically said the Jews need a homeland because of all the anti-Semitism. And in December of 1917, the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the United Nations, gave the, what's called the British Mandate and said, okay, Britain, you have control over this area. And so the Brits had already said, we want the Jews 
to be back in the land. We think they need to be back in the land. And because of this, now the Ottoman Empire was gone. The British were favorable to the Jews. There still wasn't an Israel, but the Jews started streaming in to that area like never before. 1919 to 1923, 35,000 more returned. 1924 to 1931, 82,000 returned. And now Hitler is starting to rise in Germany and in Europe. And anti-Semitism is growing stronger and stronger. You want to know where anti-Semitism comes from? It's satanic. And anti-Semitism grows and they're seeing the rise of Hitler and 250,000 Jews return to their homeland. World War I set the stage because it was necessary that the Ottoman Empire fall. And then World War II, just 20 years later, 1939 to 1945, and you know what happened. Hitler kills 6 million Jews trying to exterminate the Jewish race. Why? Because it's satanic. Satan doesn't want the Jews to live because of all the promises in the scriptures. He wants to exterminate them. He doesn't want them in their land. And of course, it was the worst world war ever. 70 million, some say 80 million people died. It was the worst war it, the world's ever seen. But because of that war, it was necessary. And yes, the six million Jews, it was horrible. But the world stepped back and said, okay, the Jews need a homeland. This is not right what happened to them. And so Israel was born. To me, that's another sign. As I've told you, I know ad finitum, Israel is the first and only ancient nation to come back. It's never happened before. That's a miracle. Come back with their own language, their own customs. They've taken an area, Jerusalem is basically a desert heap, and they have turned that place into an oasis. Israel's the only country that's ever come back from the dead, from extinction. And in 1948, they were born. And as Isaiah said, I believe in Isaiah 65, can a nation be born in a day? Yes. May 14th, 1948, Israel came back. And, and, and just going back to our parable here, Luke 29, 21, 29, Jesus told them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees, and as soon as they put on leaves, you can see for yourselves and recognize that summer is already near. And in the same way, when you see these things happen, recognize that the kingdom is at the door. You know what's interesting to me? is here Jesus says, look at the fig tree and all the trees. I wondered, why didn't Jesus say, look at all the trees? Why does he say the fig tree? Well, again, Jesus doesn't say things by accident. If you go back into the book of Joel and the book of Habakkuk and, and the book of Hosea, you will see that Jerusalem is compared to the fig tree. And when John came on the scene in Matthew, John the baptizer, and in Luke 3, he said the, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. What tree do you think he's talking about? I think the fig tree. That's the only tree that was ever compared to Israel. And so Jesus says, look at the fig tree. And when you see the leaves coming, you know that summer is near. Why? Because for the return of Christ to happen, Israel has to be back in their land. Jesus is going to rule on the throne. Israel has to be back in their land. And for 2,000 years, theologians said, oh, that's never going to happen. It's all spiritual. It's all about the church. No, it was about a literal nation returning. And they are there. And it had to happen. And in 1948, the fig tree came back. And it began to sprout leaves. But notice Jesus didn't say, when you see it produce fruit. Because Israel is not a Christian nation. It is a secular nation. It is not producing fruit. Israel has been gathered in unbelief. In fact, go, keep going here. I want you to look at the next sign. Rebellion. Go back to verse 9 real quick and we'll tie this in. Verse 9, Jesus said, when you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed. It is necessary things take place. Now, we've already seen the wars, World War I and World War II, were necessary for Israel to come back. What about the rebellions? There's always been rebellion. 
What kind of rebellion are we talking about, Jesus? It seems like this is a unique rebellion that's necessary. Well, my brothers and sisters, guess what happened in the 1960s? By the way, six is the number of humanity. In the 1960s, the world saw the greatest rebellion it's ever seen. Here's from History.com. 1960s was one of the most tumultuous and divisive decades in human history. The era was marked by civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the anti-war pros, countercultural movements, political assassinations, and the emerging generation gap. Encyclopedia Britannica described the 1960s as this. Counterculture, a broad-ranging social movement in the United States Canada and Western Europe, this wasn't just the United States, that rejected conventional mores and traditional authorities whose members voraciously advocated peace, love, social justice, and revolution. The 1960s countercultural movement, which generally extended into the early 70s, was an alternative approach to life that manifested itself in a variety of activities, lifestyles, and artistic expressions, including recreational drug use, communal living, political protests, casual sex, and folk and rock music. When you look at the 1960s, that decade stands out as a unique decade of all decades that have ever happened. And we're seeing the fruit of it today. Rampant drug use, churches no longer preaching the Bible, family units being decimated, our moral footing has been lost. And, and, and you say, but Jim, that was the United States and Europe and Canada... I thought you said prophecy centers on Israel. It does. You say, well, what does that have to do with Israel? You know, this week, you probably heard the news that Ibrahim Rossi, Racy, however you want to say it, the butcher of Iran was killed in a helicopter class. Y'all saw that. There might be some political uh, uh, prophetic implications there. I don't know. He was called the butcher of Iran because... After the Iran-Iraq war, he signed off on the execution of over 8,000 political prisoners. And then in 2012, there was a big protest that erupted in Iran because of the moral police. A young lady didn't wear her headdress right, and, and they killed her. And there was big uprising. It was the biggest uprising since 79. And again, Raisi had 500 of the young people executed, and he imprisoned 22,000 other people. So he's called the butcher of Baghdad. Why do I bring that up? In Islamic countries, they do not tolerate things. It's interesting that you see on the college campuses all these groups, queers for Palestine and all that. Do you know if you were gay and were to go over there what they'd do to you? They'd kill you. If you were to go over to Hamas, the Gaza Strip, Hamas would kill you if you were gay. They would throw you off the top of the buildings because that's what they do. They do not tolerate LGBTQ in those parts of the world. They, they do not tolerate if you don't wear the headdresses, ladies. They do not tolerate those things. Islam is a very unbending religion in countries where they are executing their Sharia law. And what's interesting, though, is in Islamic countries, you got this little, little nation called Israel. And it's all surrounded by Islamic countries. But did you know Israel is the only democracy over there and it is a democracy that's influenced by Western values. Do you know that if you go to any country around Israel, they'll kill you if you're LGBTQ. If you go to Israel, they'll applaud you. Tel Aviv is one of the most gay-friendly areas in the world. Israel is one of the most relaxed, moral places in the world. Their nightclub scene is just like anything you'd see in New York or L.A. They, in Israel, yes, there's Orthodox Jews, but Israel's a secular nation. They're just like the West. They, they don't subscribe to those harsh things. Make no mistake about it. Israel has rebelled too against God. You say, why has God brought them back in their land? Because, according to Ezekiel, God has regathered them for judgment. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 20, 37, the dry bones... Ezekiel sees these dry bones and he prophesies and they come together. If you read the passage closely, it says they came together, but they had no life in them. That's Israel right now. They have come together as a nation, but there's no life. They are a void. They do not follow God. So let me give you a recap. Jesus said there's wars and rebellions that are necessary. 
And it looks like to me, World War I and World War II were necessary. They had to happen for Israel to be reborn. And there's been this rebellion that we saw in the 60s that was necessary. I don't know about you, but I think we're in the last generation. Because nothing like this has ever, ever happened. But there's something interesting, too. Another reason I think we're in the final generation, and that's the other trees. You say, what? We'll go back to our text. He told them, look at the fig tree and all the trees. Again, I just asked myself, why didn't he just say, look at all the trees? Why does he do the fig tree? Well, apparently, he was pointing in the direction of Israel. Why didn't he just say, look at the fig tree? Why did he put all the trees? Again, I don't think Jesus says things by accident. And he says, as soon as you see them put on leaves, you see for yourselves, recognize summer is near. And in the same way, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. It's interesting that when you look at the countries that surround Israel, the modern states all came into existence after World War I and World War II. Turkey, 1923, Iraq, 1932, Syria, 1946, Lebanon, 1943, Jordan, 1946, Saudi Arabia, 1932, Egypt, 1922. The modern states that surround Israel today came into existence after World War I and World War II. To me, I'm thinking that must be the other leaves. When you look at Israel, Israel's right here. All these nation states that came into existence after World War I and World War II. I find that intriguing. It's also interesting, here's little Israel right there. All this is Muslim, 95 to 99% Muslim. This is 90 to 95% all around Israel. I think that's interesting, and I don't think it's by accident. When you look at the nation, when Israel was in its homeland in the biblical days, all the enemies of Israel, Bashan, Ammonites, Amorites, Moabites, the Philistines, these make up all those nations now that we see that are around Israel, Iraq, Turkey, all those nations, Saudi Arabia, all that stuff. It's the old enemies of Israel are back. By the way, if you look at a map of Israel, there's one there. You'll notice this is different color because Israel doesn't control. It's called the Gaza Strip. We've been watching that, right? Israel gave the Palestinians control of the Gaza Strip in 2000, I believe 2005. And since that time, they didn't worry about building up their infrastructure. In 2006, they elected Hamas, and they've been lobbing rockets into Israel since then, the Gaza Strip. You know who used to occupy the Gaza Strip, by the way, in biblical times? The Philistines. I find that interesting. The Golan Heights, which Israel does have control, but right in this area is where Hezbollah is, and they're throwing rockets into Israel. It is backed by Iran, the strongest terroristic force in the world. Do you know this area is called the area of Bashan? Do you know that's the area where the Nephilim came from? And the angels descended Mount Hermon. It's right up there. And what you're seeing in the world today, we are watching on our TVs almost every day anti-Semitic protests on college campuses and around the world. Anti-Semitism is growing and growing. And I'm telling you, this is Zechariah's prophecy. Because Zechariah said, before Jesus Christ comes back, on that day, God says, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples who try to lift it, will injure themselves severely when all the nations of the earth gather against her. We are seeing, because of anti-Semitism, Jerusalem is the problem. The Jews are the problems. I ran across this tweet. I, had, I don't know if you can see it. But somebody put here, delete one country from the earth to make the world peaceful. We are seeing people today, they're saying, if we just get rid of the Jews, just get rid of Israel, we'll finally have peace. It's exactly what Zechariah said was going to happen. I do believe we're in the final generation. And Jesus says, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all things take place. So if a generation is about 100 years, as defined by God in Genesis 15, and if the starting point is the rebirth of Israel when the, the fig tree put on leaves in 1948, then that means we only have a few decades left before the 100 years is up. And again, world, it, world events are changing rapidly. Just I mean, it changes. It's changing fast. And look how and Jesus was emphatic about this Truly I say to you, truly I tell you, 
you know, Jesus like emphatic, this generation will not pass away until these things have happened, and heaven and earth will not pass away, but my words. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I, th I ask myself, why is Jesus so emphatic about this generation? Because I think he knew that until this time, people would try to explain away a lot of stuff. Oh, it's Israel's about the church in the Old Testament. It's called replacement theology, you know. Oh, you know, there, there's no way an ancient nation would ever come back to life. You know, oh, I, I don't know. How could a, such a little nation the size of New Jersey become such a big problem for the world? Oh, this isn't going to happen. And Jesus is like, I'm telling you the truth. This generation is not going to pass away when these things happen. You'll see these things. And wrapping it up in Luke 18... Jesus talks about this, his second coming again. He references it, and he says, I tell you, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Why does he ask that question? As we talked about a few weeks ago, one of the signs of his return is the apostasy, the falling away of most people, including the church. And Jesus knows the days are going to get dark, and he says, when I come, where am I going to find faith? And you say, what do I do with this, Jim? Do I need to start prepping, build my bomb shelters, storing up water? Oh, wouldn't hurt, I guess. <laughs> That's up to you. You do you. I don't want you to live in fear. I, I don't know about you. I'm going to look up, lift up my heads. Amen. I know my redemption's coming. I may get to see it. I don't know. That's crazy. We may, I think we're the, the generation. I could be wrong. If, if 28 comes and goes and you're still alive and I am, then you can talk to me about it. But I really think it's, we're in the last couple decades. I don't know when he's coming back. And Jesus said, you know, you don't know the day or the hour, but he didn't say you don't know the season. And I think the season is upon us because we've seen the fig tree bloom. And Jesus ends his talk, and this would be what I would challenge you and me. Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing drunkenness and worries of this life or that day will come upon you unexpectedly. You know what? The majority of people have no clue what's coming. And Jesus warns his followers, don't you be one of those people. We should be students of prophecy. And don't get so wrapped up in the cares of this life, because it's all going away. Like a trap, for it will come on those who live on the face of the earth. That day will come like a trap, but be alert at all times praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Real quickly, I know we're past time. Revelation 22 talks about the New Jerusalem, and it says outside are the fornicators, and it goes through all this stuff, but one, it says cowards. Outside are the cowards. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a coward. I don't want to be a coward. There's going to be a lot of pressure to conform, and it's going to get worse. Jesus said, be alert and pray that you'll have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And my question to you is, are you ready for the return of Jesus? I want you to think about it. You go home today, think about it. What if Pastor Jim's right? What if we only have roughly 20 years left? Could be any time in the next 20, 24 years. I don't know. What if that's true? What if the uniqueness of World War I and World War II, you can't deny that. And you can't deny that it set the stage for the return of Israel. You can't deny Israel's back in its land. You can't deny the anti-Semitism that we're seeing growing and growing around the world. You can't deny this, folks. It's right in front of our faces. You can't deny that there's been a massive rebellion in the world that started in the 60s and continues today. You can't deny that. It's been worldwide. And Israel's involved in the midst of it too. You can't deny these things. To me, you look at human history, you can't point back to anything unique like what we've experienced in the recent memory. And you can't deny all these other nations that have come around Israel and the fact you can't deny they're all Muslim they want to destroy Israel you can't deny this and you can bury your heads in sand water went in water no it's not going to happen not going to happen fine I've done my part I hope you're ready I hope you're ready let's pray Father 
Certainly, I don't want to go through the tumultuous times that are ahead of us before Jesus returns. But on the other hand, if it be that your will, so be it. And may we stand strong. May we be alert, not have our heads in the sand. May we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And he's told us how it's going to end. He's going to come back and reign victoriously. He's going to put his enemies under his feet. But Father, we know that it's going to come to a climax before Jesus steps back into history. I pray for the believers here that we'll be strong, steadfast, unmovable, unbounding in the work of the Lord until that day. Work for the night is coming. May we at Warren continue to share the gospel and love people. And for anybody watching online or here that does not know Jesus, I pray that they will get on their knees today and surrender their life to Him. They do not want to be caught up without Christ in the midst of this. Because hell is going to come to this earth. And Father, we do not need to live in fear. Live in strength. Because we know how it's going to end. And we know that Jesus is going to be victorious. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Give us patience. And may we stand firm. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.